This program is made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation. A co-production by Mississippi Public Broadcasting and the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. April 20th, 2010. 41 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. BP's Deepwater Horizon Drilling Unit exploded after high-pressure methane gas engulfed the rig and exploded. 11 people would lose their lives that night. For nearly three months, oil gushed into the Gulf of Mexico. Marine life, tourism, and petroleum operations will never be the same in the Gulf region. Now there are questions that have scientists focusing on trying to shed light on the unknown long-term effects on the Gulf. This is The Science of the Spill. Hello and welcome to The Science of the Spill. I'm Erin Pickens. And I'm Dr. Bob Thomas, Director of the Center for Environmental Communication at Loyola University. Now, the Science of the Spill is produced by the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory and Mississippi Public Broadcasting to inform the public with scientifically proven facts concerning the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. We're going to bring together scientists that are studying this disaster for inf informative discussion to give the facts about issues related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. We also want to let you know you can find more on our companion website at SpillScience.com. There you can find in-depth information about topics related to the spill, as well as video discussions from scientists studying the effects of the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You may also want to join the discussion on our blog section of the site where you can engage in discussions with scientists studying the impacts from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Again, that's SpillScience.com. A Mississippi Public Broadcasting crew traveled out to Cat Island and both East and West Ship Islands recently to document what effects are being seen on the islands today, seven months after the blowout of the Deepwater Horizon rig. With respect to the oil spill incident, these islands did serve as the first line of defense, albeit in a different perspective than what's usually referred to within more of a storm context. In many respects, there was a parallel to what occurred in the oil spill incident in that the oil stranding or oil on the beach that first occurred happened on the barrier islands. And one could say, as a result of that, it either dissipated or reduced the level of oiling that otherwise may have occurred on the mainland and reduced the amount of oil that otherwise would have gone into the uh, sound where we have very uh, sensitive uh, seagrass uh, beds that give rise to, uh, you know, fisheries and uh, other sensitivities within the bays. Okay, well, we're on the uh, southeast side of Cat Island, um, on the west side of Smuggler's Cove out here with all this beautiful marsh back back here. So one of the things that we're hoping to try to see is if there is any evidence of where oil washed up into the marsh in these areas behind us during high tides and if it was deposited there. Because that's what we see on the beach over on the, the western side is, is the deposits of those asphaltines that what they call pepper here those little tar patties all over the beach and you would find something different in the marsh here removal of oil began uh, almost uh, right after the inception of the incident. Um, there was some delay from the time of the blowout until we began to experience oil on the shoreline, but within approximately uh, 40 days we began to see oil in earnest across all of our shoreline areas in both Mississippi and Florida. On all of these islands, the, the BP cleanup activities have been centered around um, doing using people with scoops, these little nets that they sift through the sand, or using some sort of a mechanized piece of machinery to do it, and they, they use two. On Horn Island, they have these very large sand machines like they use on beaches everywhere that scoops up, cleans the top few inches of sand, those tar patties, and here they have a, a specially designed for this beach little, it looks like a, uh, a lawn mower that you walk behind that's a smaller version that scoops up the first top couple of inches, sifts the sand through and those little tar patties are left on that screen and then they bag them up and take them away. What needs to be kept in mind when you come out here is that Ship Island has some unusual sand deposits here that, that have some uh, 
different component minerals in it, ilmenite and tourmaline, that makes it look kind of like oil. And you see that in my hand here is the naturally occurring sand deposits that, while looking more like oil than the actual oil does, are actually a natural occurrence, the oil being part of the man-made event. So there's two different black uh, constituents on the surface here. One, this naturally occurring uh, sand, and the other, this oil patties from the BP event. When an incident such as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurs, it certainly causes one to pause and take uh, a moment of concern. What is going to be the ultimate effect on these islands? We really did not know. I know I had horrors of going anywhere in the park, whether it be in Mississippi and Florida, on the south shoreline, looking east, looking west, and seeing nothing but a tar uh, mat of oil. That did not um, occur, which is fortunate, but we still have significant oiling and impacts that have occurred to our shoreline. So, we're looking at it very keenly to make sure that we respond appropriately and long-term do everything feasibly possible from a management perspective to make sure these systems function as intended and that uh, we do not interfere with them to uh, cause any more harm. Now, while the Barrier Islands off Mississippi's coast served as the first line of defense in the oil spill of 2010, crews continue hard work to clean the islands of oil. Now, let's hear from our panelists about the effects of oil on the islands and other parts of our coastal ecology. We'd like to, to welcome our two guests today. Uh, first is Dr. Jesse Kassler, who's a research associate at the Gulf Coast Research Lab and University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, Jesse is a coastal scientist and an educator. Uh, second is Dr. Ed Overton, who is Professor Emeritus of Environmental Sciences at Louisiana State University, and he is a oil chemistry expert, and we're looking forward to his comments. Welcome. Thank Glad you. With us. Good. Well, Jesse, uh, coming from that, off of that video here where they talked about the barrier islands, um, there were two different types of machines used out there. Why is that? Well, I don't exactly know, just to be clear about this, but we did find different machines on Horn Island versus Cat Island. And my sense, um, and this is actually what I studied, I'm a sedimentologist, but um, I think that the reasoning is just as simple as uh, uh, it could be related to the animals that live there uh, and they don't want to disturb the habitat. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's archaeological artifacts which I know were found on Ship Island and so they have that sort of rototiller looking machine that they use to clean up uh, in that area and it doesn't go below six inches and so it doesn't disturb buried ar archaeological artifacts. Now the video showed sand that looks oily but does not contain oil. It looks like you brought some samples here to show us exactly what is oil and what is not. Absolutely and we have two examples of um, oiled sand. Mm -hmm. One of them is relatively fresh. Um, it's from September, mm -hmm. early September, and those are, are clearly oily. Um, there's oil in, in this sand. It's all the same sand all the way through, all mm -hmm. collected from our Mississippi Barrier Islands. The second uh, plate has more weathered uh, uh, samples mm -hmm. of oil and and that's what we they were picking up on Cat Island the mm -hmm. day that we went out there it was in November mm -hmm. however what um, Chris Snyder on the inter on the the interview was talking mm -hmm. about was the presence of um, some heavy minerals and they're they're heavier and so because they have iron and things like that in them and that is what you see over there is the normal sand um, that doesn't have a lot exactly mm -hmm. of that ilmenite in it, mm -hmm. but you get concentrations when the wind is, is moving at a yeah. certain velocity that makes for big deposits of these black sands mm -hmm. and people see them buried and they're not oil. Wow. Okay. Well, Ed, I know that uh, running an oil lab at LSU, you've been sort of the go-to uh, scientist when people are reporting mm -hmm. uh, what they call oil on the beaches or oil in the water. Tell us some of your stories. What kind of things are people bringing in for you to examine? Well, with a spill where you have 200 million gallons of oil, it, the, the natural uh, event is to say anything you see in the environment is associated with oil. And the truth is that there's a lot of things out there that are just naturally occurring, such as this black sand. So that is that should be there. It's been there. Uh, but, but when you compare it to white sand, you know oil's dark, black color. You think, my gosh, this is contamination. 
what we have to remember is that oil, as it moves into the coastal areas, oil tends to glob to itself. It doesn't like to dissolve in the water, but it sticks to itself. So when it, when it gets on shore, you find it in clumps such as these tar balls here. Mm -hmm. the, the clumps of oil, uh, uh, sand particles stick to the outside of the clumps of oil, so they look a little bit different, but they, they would not evenly cover the beaches such as we see with this dark, uh, dark oil, dark sand. That's not oil samples at all. Lots of, of algal blooms associated with this time of the year, and people look down and they see something strange in the water, discolored water, and they say, my gosh, it's dispersed oil not dispersed oil. It's biological events that have been there for millions of years. It's just we're now starting to look and we know in the background that there's a, a large oil spill offshore. Mm -hmm. so. Well, when, when these oil spills happen, it's not just something happening in a, in a vacuum. I mean, there's already a, a microbial fauna out there that, uh, that lives off, gets its energy from oil. And, uh, and I think the public has, uh, uh, who we're speaking to here uh, has, has probably been surprised by some of the images they've seen when they report it as oil and they say, well, that just looked like orange stuff floating on the surface. Tell us a little bit about that, about how it looks. Okay, well, well, when oil comes out of the ground, particularly for this well, it's got a lot of gas in it. So the first thing that happens is that that gas dissolves and effervesces away and breaks up the oil, a lot of the oil, into really, really tiny droplets. And those droplets stay down in the deep water. So that's oil that has been dispersed at depth. Some of the oil comes out as big globs, and it kind of floats to the surface, and it gets there fairly quickly. And there's a difference between the big globs and the, the oil that's so small that it can't rise to the surface. That oil comes up to the surface fairly slowly, and it interacts with water. It mixes with water, and so you see these different colored, we call them mousse. Uh, a, a mousse is a, a combination of oil and water. It's an emulsion. It's a stable emulsion. It, it, it's a mixture much like mayonnaise that, uh, that involves oil components and water components, and they take on a different colors depending on how much sunlight they've been exposed to and a variety of other incidents. So what we see is in this case, there's seven or eight different appearances to the oil all the way from a, from a liquid material down to tar balls, which we see here on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I know that some of the times that people are reporting what they consider to be oil because it's the color of the moose and seems from a helicopter to be the consistency of the moose turns out to be algae. Absolutely. Algae, uh, uh, the first reports we ever got were this uh, peak material washing up on Chandelier Islands. And everybody said, look at this dispersed oil. Uh, it was not dispersed oil. It was a biological event. When they brought it to the lab, we put it through tests that can very definitively tell whether it's from petroleum or not. And these were not uh, samples of oil at all. So, right. so we, the, the Mother Nature has many different forms in the environment. And in this case, we've got oil on top of all of these forms. So when we see some of these strange events, we say, oh, my gosh, oh, look at all the oil. In fact, that's not the oil. Oil has a very specific con uh, consistency. The tar balls are kind of the, the end of the, the regime. Oil comes out, and it's a liquid material. It mixes with the mousse and becomes pretty viscous and ultimately breaks apart into these tar balls, and these are what are washing ashore on the barrier islands. Some of the coastal marshes actually got some pretty liquid oil, but it wasn't fresh oil. Fresh oil is the dangerous kind. It, 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 all oil, it would be better if it were not on the beaches and on the coastal marshes. But it's a much worse situation when the oil is fresh. That is, it has a lot of the light components, the volatile components that can dissolve down in the water column, cause damage. So fortunately in this spill, most of the oil that hit the shorelines was either weathered oil or in this uh, relatively benign form called tar balls. Right. You know, I, I think sometimes these problems are, uh, are compounded because we forget that there's a lot of people working down there that have different, uh, different priorities. You know, the media are there to show you oil. They That's want right. to find it and they want to show it to you. And so it's real common for people to get a shot from the air where they're really shooting some kind of organic uh, material coming out of the marshes mm. or the like. And then it comes to your lab and other labs along the Gulf Coast and you have to deliver the news about what these things are and try to explain to people how the mistake was made. That's correct? Absolutely. I, I know in, when the spill started, people would fly out, the, the news media would fly out in helicopters, and they would fly out for an hour and a half and not see any oil. And all of a sudden, there's a big patch of oil down there, and so they would start circling it. And the picture was that there's oil like this everywhere. The truth is it was not. It was very patchy. There was globs of oil offshore. Now, there were a lot of globs, but there was a mostly open ocean that didn't have these massive globs of oil in it. So, but 
getting that that picture, nobody wants to see ocean water where there's nothing in it. So when you're talking about an oil spill, you fly out and you focus on what's out there, oil. But that doesn't mean the right. whole environment is completely coated with oil. Right. Yeah, I had that experience when I took uh, uh, a few news crews out in helicopters and people would say, uh, you know, the camera was ready and they'd say, well, here's oil over here. No, that's organic material. That's right. Here's oil over here. No, that's the... Uh, uh, that's minerals right. up on the beach, and, and uh, at first you almost lose your credibility because everybody thinks there's oil everywhere, but uh, uh, thank God there wasn't as much as we thought. But uh, but uh, thank you for that because that's that's a real public service, I think, when people go, when scientists come out and talk to people to help them understand more what these things are. Well, trained observers know what oil looks like, yeah. and, and most of the people that go out looking for oil were not trained observers, and so they tend to see anything that's not looking like clear water is calling it oil. That's just not the case. You've sure. got to rely on people that have done it before mm -hmm. and understand what it looks like. Well, I think it's also safe to say that we're learning a lot more about uh, some variabilities in our co coastal ecosystem. Even though we understand that system well, uh, we're now getting more reports of things that people fear are oil mm -hmm. uh, that turn out to be algae. And people are saying, well, is that algae stimulated by the breakdown components of oil? In some cases, it's probably just that people are reporting things now that they used to just look at and say, I wonder what that is, and pass right by it. Absolutely. I remember sailing in Lake Pontchartrain, and we'd get out and see this yellow stuff floating in the water and didn't pay any attention to it. It didn't bother the sailing. Uh, we didn't think it was oil. It wasn't oil. It was a, a natural bloom of some sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this year, when there's a big spill, people, everything they see is related to the spill. And that, uh, fortunately, that's not the case. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, again, a great service. Uh, Jesse, let's return to the Barry Islands for a moment, sure. the, the video we just watched. And uh, Mr. Clark uh, uh, gave us a lot of information that wasn't shown there. What were some of the interesting things he talked about? He actually had a couple of interesting things to say. That um, This is actually an opportunity for me to plug the, uh, the website, too. If you go to SpillScience.com, you can see all of the interviews in their entirety. But some of the things that he talked about um, are that some of the equipment that we saw and assumed was part of the cleanup effort is actually dredging and material that's ordinarily being dredged from Gulfport Channel, ship channel, is going to be used in beach nourishment near Fort Massachusetts on West Ship Island. Um, that was interesting and completely unrelated to the oil spill. Um, but he, he was um, telling me a bit about the, uh, the number of species that were affected Gulf-wide, Roughly 3,000. There weren't that many that were affected in Gulf Islands. The ones in Gulf Islands um, were mostly uh, shorebirds, um, and there have been far fewer impacted animals observed since the the well was capped. Um, and and finally, he he was talking about some research that is beginning on the Gulf Islands that will be looking into the effects of the oil spill on on the habitat. And those, um, those studies are just beginning as part of the Natural Resources Damage Assessment Program. And uh, they'll be looking at not just how the animals are affected, but also how long is the oil staying, because mm -hmm. they haven't been able to get it all. And at some point, you have to stop, because it becomes more damaging to keep trying. Uh, and so they'll be looking at how long does the oil stay and what kind of effect it has on those animals. Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of, a lot of naturalists are concerned that um, uh, by sifting through the sands in yes. vast quantities, you may be removing a lot of the food sources for the bottom of the ecosystem, or the species diversity is changing, or, yes. uh, you know, we keep hearing reports, which, which I, I know are true because I've seen it myself, where the oil is settling down in the sand, and we're wondering what happens three or four years from now when that gets turned out in a storm. Well, and actually, that is something that you may have something to say about, um, Ed, because it, it's something that was observed mm -hmm. in the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill. Um, but another thing you're worried about in that context is that there are lots of animals that live on the beach, and they're not real obvious. They're not pelicans. They're not piping plovers. They're in the sand, and they're worms and shells and things like that. Mm -hmm. but yes. Sometimes when oil weathers, you know, it starts off, and it's, it's much more toxic than uh, it is after it reaches this final weathering stage, which is these tar balls. So there's a question of how dangerous are those, and are you doing more damage to the ecosystem of a beach by removing them than leaving them there? 
right? Uh, they're not easy to digest. They don't readily dissolve. They weather very slowly, break apart, and they will be on the beach for several years to come. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. from the after the Ixtoc spill on South Padre Island, uh, tar balls were washing up at, at an elevated level for several years. And so that's going to happen along our coastal beaches. It's happening up in the marshes, but of course you can't see the tar balls in the marshes because they get hit by all the grass. So they're pretty obvious on a on a white sandy beach when you walk along and you step on something funny and you you got a smudge of oil, but it's not really causing a lot of ecological damage. So the real question is, is it worth the effort to disrupt the beach structure of the animals that live there because because they are part of the food chain, part of the ecology mm -hmm. of the northern gulf. And so uh, the, the lesson for most spills is there's a time to stop and let Mother Nature handle it, and we are probably there now. That's right. Particularly yeah, well, on sandy beaches. Sure. Well, you know, one of my favorite things to do when we go to the beach is to walk down the beach and try to find the critters that live in that sand that you're Absolutely. talking about. And uh, there's, it's not accidental that you see those little birds running up and down and pecking in the sand. That's right. They're not just pecking in the sand; they're feeding. And there's an, a wealth of, inf of uh, species that live in that area. Well, let's uh, let's talk for uh, about a topic that's on everybody's mind. Let's talk about seafood safety. Exactly, and with the state and, mis state and federal officials at the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources and the NOAA Fisheries Service and National Seafood Inspection Lab in Pascagoula, they're testing seafood harvested in the Gulf that's destined for seafood markets in Mississippi. In the state of Mississippi, there are, there are three regulatory agencies that, that have some say in that process. It's Department of Ag, the Department of Health, and the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. Our role in, in, in seafood safety specifically is we have a Seafood Technology Bureau that, that's responsible for that. And in response to the BP oil spill, we've done several additional things than what we normally do. We've done this for decades. Uh, keeping the seafood safe for the state of Mississippi. We do dockside evaluations. That means where we, our inspectors go down to the docks where the product is being landed and does evaluations of that product there. Uh, we also do the actual water quality. We do that in conjunction with the DEQ. We also do sampling of the product while it's out in the water. We take tissue samples of shrimp, crab, fish, and oysters. The protocols and the standards that were used um, for sampling and for analysis um, of the seafood in response to the Deepwater Horizon um, were adopted uh, at the federal level and at the state level. So there was, there was consistency in how the sampling was done as well as how the analyses were done. All those samples come back to this lab. Um, we have the National Seafood Inspection Laboratory that's part of this facility. Um, so the, the sampling, uh, sample processing is done here, the sensory analysis is done here, and then samples are sent to the Northwest Fishery Science Center for chemical analysis. So when we receive a um, um, seafood sample uh, at the lab in, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, they're processed and prepared for uh, sensory testing, uh, which is a, a well-developed test to de detect odors from petroleum. Um, if the sample passes that test, then the sample has, uh, is analyzed by an analytical chemical test, uh, which looks at specific compounds um, uh, present in oil called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the FDA, through, based on a lot of science, has determined that those are the compounds of concern uh, from human health. So the, the, during this spill, those samples were uh, sent to our Seattle National Marine Fisheries Service lab where they were uh, extracted and then put on a very sensitive uh, instrument that separates the compounds into the individual uh, compounds and then detects them at a very accurate and very specific uh, way. The types of species that we take so far to date, we, we have 18 different representative species of fish that have been taken. And those are representative samples from the, the top waters, the pelagic type fish, and that would be things like mackerels and cobia and those type of, and they, they are offshore species of fish and they're inshore species of fish. And then we got the mesic fish, um, and those things include things like the drums, uh, the menhaden, and then we got our bottom dwellers, which are things like flounders and catfish and ground mullet. Uh, speckled trout, so it, it runs the whole gamut. Uh, we have two, two, three different species of shark that we've taken. So we're very confident that we're selecting the species that uh, represent 
as far as seafood safety, the things that the public we can come in contact with, and those data are available on our website. And like I'll say again, they have all come back non-detect or well below the NOAA protocols for those hundreds or thousands of tons, in some instances below those protocol levels. Fish, shrimp, and clams, um, and bivalves as they're called, all handle pHs in a different way. These compounds have been in, in our environment for a long time, and so uh, these animals have adapted to dealing with their presence. So for in the case of shrimp and fish, they have the ability, when these compounds are taken up, to what's called metabolize them, turn them into compounds that are, can be more easily processed and then excreted and gotten rid of by shrimp and fish. And what that means is that the pHs that were taken up don't have the ability to get to the edible tissue, the muscle tissue. The public needs to recognize about difference between chemicals. They're not all the same. And in the case of pHs, uh, they can be metabolized and excreted. Other compounds, uh, they cannot. Um, there's, there's new research, the dispersant um, research that was done for this oil spill. Um, that was new research. That was something that, that we didn't have a lot of science behind. Um, so there was, you know, very, very quick turnaround time trying to, to get that research in place, get the result, um, you know, look at the impacts of the dispersants on seafood safety. Um, so that was, you know, something we learned um, with, with this spill that will apply to the next spill. During the spill, um, the American public and people in the Gulf became very concerned about the, low, the amount of uh, dispersants and, that had been used and whether or not those dispersants posed a, a health risk to people consuming seafood. So in response to that, FDA and, and NOAA worked uh, diligently uh, during, at, during the spill to develop a, a new method to de be able to detect a compound present in dispersants called uh, DOS dioxyl sodium sulfur succinate, big word, but it's just a compound in DOS that we felt would be a good marker of the presence of uh, dispersant if it was present. But what we did know from the literature and, and, and the findings and what we know about these chemicals is that the potential for any accumulation of the dispersant compounds in seafood was very low. The science, you know, stands behind the results. Um, and, you know, again, I, I would say that the seafood in the Gulf of Mexico is safe. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with what's reaching the market right now. Um, it's, it's being checked at many, many different levels, and, and it's, it's never failed. Now, seafood safety continues to be an extremely important issue to the producers and the consuming public of Gulf seafood. Bob? Well, um, Ed, uh, you've been involved in... in you know, oil spills and oil accidents and things for decades. And, uh, and I think before we get into talking about, uh, uh, on set here, about um, uh, seafood safety and about what we have to be concerned about, I think we need to know a little bit more about what's out there now. We know there was crude oil. What's happened to that crude oil? What's it turned into and what are we dealing with? Well, crude oil starts off as, a, as a many thousands of different compounds that are blended together that, uh, that form the product that we know as oil. When it goes in the environment, it starts changing in composition. The small molecules, the more volatile molecules will evaporate, they'll dissolve into the water column. These are the most dangerous components in oil. So that leaves behind kind of a gunky, oily residue that, that floats around. Again, it, can, it continues to undergo change by bacteria, by the uh, action of the sunlight, the photooxidation. Uh, some of it dissolves into sediments and, and as it gets near coastal uh, areas and can absorb the, on the sediments and sink to the bottom, so, which is what we've got here. These things, these tar balls don't float around. If the tar balls are offshore, typically they are buoyant and they're floating around. So the oil undergoes this compositional change, which in general makes it a lot less dangerous. So the longer it can stay in the environment before coming ashore where it causes most of the damage, the better. Now, of course, while it's offshore, it's causing damage to offshore marine environments, particularly those little critters that live right at the surface. Mm -hmm. But the biological density offshore relative to the biological density in coastal marshes is much, much less. I mean, by a factor of 100 or so, you have more critters living in the marsh and in near coastal environments than you have way offshore. 
any any offshore fisherman tells you that. He goes out there and fishes all day and is lucky to catch a tuna or two. Whereas if you go into the coastal marshes, you catch your limit of fish almost immediately within an hour or two. Mm -hmm. That's biological density. So mm -hmm. what we don't want is a lot of oil coming ashore in coastal marshes and can have an, an impact. So oil offshore is better than oil near shore if you've got to have oil at all. Yeah. Well, I think the public's gotten sort of a course in uh, uh, petrochemical 101 uh, <laughs> over the last few months. But uh, what are these uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? Easier to call them PAHs. Uh, what, tell us what they are and, and why people are so concerned about them. Well, oil has many thousands of different compounds, but there's a class of compounds in oils that are, uh, uh, chemists say they're partially oxidized. They're called aromatic compounds. And these compounds have a special reactivity when they get in uh, uh, in, uh, living systems. There are enzymes in our bodies and in the bodies of fin fish and most marine organisms that recognize these compounds as being foreign. They're not originally there. And so they try to metabolize them so that they can be excreted. Uh, sometimes this metabolitic process will make a more dangerous form of those aromatic compounds which could attack the genetic material and either kill cells or mutate the cells. Cell mutation is very bad because that leads to cancer. So these are the types of compounds that have the, the most toxic effect in oil, the polycyclics. Mm -hmm. So almost all concern associated with oil is associated with the aromatics, including the, the one ring aromatic, benzene, and its, uh, its, its relatives, mm -hmm. and the polycyclic aromatic compounds. Those are the ones that, that we're worried about in terms of consumption of any kind of food, even for the animals that are in the environment. They can cause, just as they could cause problems for us if we consume it, they cause problems for the animals that live in the environment. Yeah. We often hear that these PAHs are uh, carcinogenic in humans. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Well, th there are, PAHs are a very broad class of compounds. Mm -hmm. There are certain of those PAHs that are uh, ability to form cancer, and they're known to do it in, in people. Now, out of the thousands and hundreds of thousands of compounds, only a very small number are known to cause cancer in people. Mm -hmm. And there are one or two PAHs that are known to cause cancer in people. They're not a strong cancer-causing potential, but they do have that mild potential to cause cancer. So we certainly don't want to do it. By the way, those PAHs are in a lot of things around us. When we charboil our steak, we're making PAHs, right? Uh, soot from fires have PAHs in it. Uh, there's any number of, of areas in our environment. PAHs are fairly ubiquitous in the environment. Uh, we just don't want elevated levels in anything we consume. The good news is about PAHs, though, that they are fairly easy to metabolize, and they do not build up in the edible tissue of fin fish and shrimp and crabs. They can accumulate in filter feeders, filter feeders like oysters and clams, because the oil would accumulate in the gut of those, and we consume the whole organism. But we don't consume the whole organism with shrimp, crabs, or uh, uh, a larger species. Right. Well, and I know one thing that really uh, uh, concerns scientists is when they read something in, in uh, the media or other sources where someone simply reports that we did a study and there are PAHs there. We did a study and there are hydrocarbons there. It really is meaningless to the reader, isn't it? A absolutely. We have a saying, if you don't find PAHs in an environmental sample, you haven't done the analysis right. PAHs are ubiquitous around the world, and, and they're made in forest fires. They're not all from oil. They're made in combustion processes. The PAHs are in coal, uh, any kind of fossil fuel. So they're, they're widely distributed in the environment. Now, yeah. elevated levels of PAHs in foodstuffs can cause problems in humans. That's why people, it's certainly tobacco smoke is another example where you have polycyclic, because that's a combustion process. We don't want to be ingesting those things. We shouldn't charboil our food. We shouldn't uh, try to, to drive behind a, a bus that's, that's setting out a, a bunch of diesel soot because pH is in diesel soot. So mm -hmm. we're exposed to those, and virtually all the time our exposures lead to no danger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very small percent, a tenth or a thousandth or a millionth of a percent, that can cause problems. Right? Just like all smokers don't catch cancer. Sure. But some of them have a greater tendency to, to develop cancer 
from exposure to the polycyclics in tobacco smoke. Right, so it's, it's really good for communication if people understand that PAHs have been linked to, to disorders that, that are unfavorable to us. Uh, and that, but if somebody reports that they are present, right. they should ask the question, what are we talking about? Give us some context. How does it work? Why should we be concerned about it? Right. For instance, PAHs don't uh, accumulate in edible tissue. But if I take a salmon and I smoke that, well, smoke has PAHs in it. So you have, in smoked foods, as an example, you have much higher levels of PAHs than you would for trying to consume. PAHs simply don't bioaccumulate in the edible portion of, of food that we eat because of our enzyme systems in, those, in our bodies and in, the, in those animals. It doesn't uh, accumulate such that it, but we can do something to that food. We can burn it or we can smoke it and that puts PAHs and then we consume them. A lot of people eat uh, barbecued food and, and, uh, and charboiled steaks for a long time. They don't get cancer. So getting cancer is a very improbable event. Unfortunately, it does happen. PAHs are one of the compounds. The PAHs in this crude oil from, from the Mikado well are not the strong cancer-causing potential that right. some PAHs are. Remember, we're talking about a big family, and some of them have a much higher potential for causing cancer than others. The good news about the PAHs in the oil is that uh, there's very low cancer-causing potential in the naphthalenes and the phenantherines, the one- and two-ring polycyclic right. aromatics. Yeah. But we still should be concerned about them and keeping an eye on them, but we should always ask those questions for clarification. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. well said, yeah. Well, let's uh, continue on this. Uh, tell us why we use the dispersants. Why were the dispersants originally used? Well, a dispersant is pure and simple, a soap for oil, right? So we've got oil floating on the surface, and sooner or later that oil is going to come ashore, right? Now, when it's offshore, well offshore, and it's floating around, it's already caused damage to the environment. Those animals that live there have been zapped by the fact that the oil came to the and, and, and interfered with their habitat. But what we don't want is that oil to move onshore, particularly to marshy uh, habitats that serve as the basis of the food chain in the northern Gulf of Mexico. For what, 90-something percent of all of the animals, the, the parts of the food chain start down in their root structures. So we don't want that oil to come ashore and cause much more massive damage than it already has offshore. So the decision is made to spray them with a soap. The soap with wind energy causes the oil to break apart and form really, really tiny little droplets that dissolve down in the water column. Now, when it dissolves in the water column, it's not going to come ashore as a big glob and cover things. Remember, the oil went in the environment. It had toxic components. Most of those toxic components have been weathered away. So it's got a, it's a sticky material, and it's, it can cover it. It can come ashore and cover uh, the, the, the grass and cause that to die away. It can get mixed down into the root structures, cause damage down there. So we would like to keep that from happening. You, you wash it off the environment. You're literally washing it off by spraying with, distert, with the dispersants. They cause the oil to break down into tiny droplets. Those droplets dissolve into the water column and are much more degradable by bacteria. The little, little droplets are easier for the bacteria to grade than a big glob. So the whole idea of dispersants is you accept damage by dispersing the oil offshore uh, to keep greater damage than coming onshore. It is literally the lesser of two evils. And most people think that it's lesser to dissolve the oil into the water column. Mm -hmm. And you're allowing exposure, by the way. It's floating on the surface. Little animals right at the surface, so they've been zapped. But when you disperse it down into the water column, of course, animals that are swimming in the water column uh, are going, getting exposed. Good news is that most fish will rep recognize that they're in oilier water. It doesn't taste good. Turn around and go the other way. If, you're, if you have structures offshore where you have barnacles and things that can't move, they are stuck there, and dispersed oil comes over them, and they get exposed to that oil, and it does cause damage. Right. Well, so. you know, when they first started using Corex, it, and everybody started learning that term, right. uh, everybody was concerned, and the, the mantra was that this stuff was very toxic, and it wasn't even able to be used in most countries of the world. Couldn't be used in shallow water, could be used in deep water. What does that mean to us in our commercial fisheries? Uh, since the, since the, the gusher, we have had plenty of time to talk about uh, and to study uh, mm -hmm. These breakdown components of core exit. Uh, what? Right. What? Uh, why should we be concerned about it now, and should we be concerned when we think about seafood safety? Right. Well, back in the in the late 60s, mid 60s, when uh, super tankers first started moving oil around the world, when our appetite for oil really grew, uh, there were several oil spills, and the dispersants that were used at that time were very dangerous to the environment. And in fact, use of the dispersants probably caused more damage than the oil. 
we've got a new generation, several new generations since the late 60s of the dispersants. Interestingly, uh, the components that go to make up this soap, which we call dispersants, are all regulated by the Food and Drug Administration for use in and around foods or around food products. Uh, interestingly, they don't. The, the dispersants corrects it. 9500 doesn't have any heavy metal, so it can't bioaccumulate that. All of the components are biodegradable, so it will not bioaccumulate, and none of them have unusual toxicities. So those are the kind of the criteria we use for determining just how dangerous is this material. Now, when you disperse oil. Most of the toxicity comes from the oil that has been dispersed. You put a little bit of dispersant, you get a lot of oil, and so the oil is dissolved down in the water column, and most environmental damage comes from the oil that's in the water column, not the dispersants. Again, you're accepting damage for dispersing the oil offshore to prevent greater damage when the oil comes onshore. It's a trade-off between the lesser of two evils. Better not to have to disperse it at all. If it was my, my choice, I would skim it, get it up, recycle it. Don't let it come ashore. But the, the name of the game is if you don't have skimmers, you've got to do something. We didn't have enough skimmers to clean the oil up. They were, the oil weathered, and it was sometimes when the weather's rough, it's hard to skim. So uh, rather than letting this thick material come ashore, it was decided to disperse it offshore. Okay. Well, um, according to the, uh, to the video, um, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources have declared seafood in most areas, all areas at the moment, right. uh, safe to eat. Uh, what are we still looking for and what should, what should the public understand when they read these announcements? Well, the first thing the public needs to understand is, is that seafood along the Gulf of Mexico, the northern Gulf of Mexico, has been more extensively tested than any other seafood in the entire world. By a long shot, I'm talking about massive amount of testing for our seafood. We don't know what's in the seafood harvest from many other areas, even those areas in the United States. So oh, yes. our, our seafood has undergone extensive quality testing. It is, we, we know, we've looked at the components from the oil in it, and we know they're not accumulating in the seafood. Mm -hmm. This is a, a strong statement that the seafood is safe to eat. When we go out and buy seafood, that may be imported into the United States. We don't know anything about that. It has not gone any of these, these uh, testing. So my statement would be that the seafood that is past uh, inspection along the northern Gulf is the safest in the world right. because it has been tested. Other seafood hasn't been tested. Yeah. So, so I encourage everybody, and I put my money where my mouth is, and I'm eating that seafood myself. Yeah. yeah. As, as often as I can get it, I might have. Well, there's been an interesting report uh, in the, the, the press recently uh, that the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, a, a national environmental group, has suggested that the uh, protocols that are being used by NOAA and, uh, and the Department of Marine Resources and others mm -hmm. uh, are making assumptions about the quantity of intake of seafood, yes. and they're using, they think, too low assumptions. And they've done a, a, a small study looking at, uh, but a significantly, mm. a statistically significant study of 547 people in fishing communities and finding out that they're eating uh, many more times uh, uh, the levels that the government is testing for. Um, uh, what does that suggest? And, and, and do you think it's something that really puts people in peril right now? Well, certainly the tests have not shown any, any significant uh, damage that you could have from eating fish, even if you double the amount that the tests say. But uh, the point I want to make is is that uh, you take that fish out, you batter it up, and you fry it. You're doing more harm by frying the fish than you would if you would take it over here and broil it. Mm -hmm. So most of the, the impacts from, from eating consumption of seafood is going to be how you handle it. Do you smoke it? Do you fry it? Are you using vegetable oils as opposed to uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uh, better tasting uh, uh, animal product oils that are out there? So that's where your damage will be. Uh, if you sit around and you do a lot of uh, imbibing with uh, uh, adult beverages while you're eating all this seafood, that's a risk. If you're sitting around and you're smoking cigarettes uh, in, in, a, in a restaurant, that's a risk. So, so in my opinion, there is a much, much larger risk from driving to the restaurant or, or the family gathering, uh, uh, enjoying the company, including adult beverages, uh, smoking cigarettes, if you're if so fond to do that, or even from secondhand smoke, all of those represent an incredibly much larger risk than consumption of seafood. Uh, 
there's, there's something like one in a hundred chance that people that drive will suffer some sort of damage. One in a hundred. And we're talking about one in tens of millions potential damage from eating seafood. Yeah. We're not even close. Yeah. We're much, rather, much more at risk from driving to and from the seafood restaurant than we are at consuming the seafood if we went there every day. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, uh, and, and interestingly, we want to add to that that, uh, that all the coastal states are finding the same things that, that Mississippi is finding as well. And, of course, you know, the oil spill is not something that's prominent in the news right now, but, you know, where is the oil right now? Actually, that is something that we're about to talk about in our third segment. We will be addressing that in terms of research that has been published. And um, is it time for us to move to that topic Yes, yet? let's move into that right Excellent. now. Excellent. Um, I don't know if y'all have anything to say, but I could certainly move straight into uh, what I was going to say, which is that um, this is our third program. This is the final program that we're producing for television on this project, and we're really shifting our emphasis now to the website, and we're continuing to add content to the website. The website has an, a lot to say about seafood safety, um, but it is also going to have um, a lot to say about some of the peer-reviewed scientific research that's coming out. And so this last segment that we're going to be talking about is um, to discuss, there are about a, there's a handful of papers that have come out, maybe 10, that have come out in the literature that really complete the process of science. The scientists since the oil spill have been going out, they've been making observations, collecting data, um, making hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, analyzing data, and now they're at the stage where they can draw their conclusions. And the final part of that process is to send it to the publisher of a journal, a scientific journal. And um, we're looking today at about four papers that do make that final step um, in peer review. The, the editor of the journal will take the uh, paper that describes analysis and send it out to colleagues of the scientists who conduct the research. Um, the papers that we're talking about today address questions like how much oil is there, where is the oil, and what does it look like? A and they also address another question that's interesting too, which is how are the microbial communities in the Gulf of Mexico responding, and how does that affect hypoxia? And I'm sorry, that term hypoxia means a reduction in the oxygen content or oxygen concentrations in the water column. So uh, I have several papers, and really the ones that we're talking about were all published in October journal, um, the October journals of the magazine Science, very um, well-regarded uh, journal, and it's where you put your first research that comes out. Uh, the first one is a paper by um, Dr. Crone and Dr. Tolstoy. They're at Lamont Doherty. Uh, laboratory at Columbia University in New, New York, they actually put out an estimate, a new actual research paper on um, how much oil was released during the eight, 84 days of the spill. And they did this um, using, it's called optical plume velocimetry. So they did image processing of the videos that we all got to see of the oil coming out of the, um, the well they looked at it before and after the riser was removed. Um, they assumed that about 40% of what was coming out of the um, pipe is, um, is liquid oil, um, not gas. Uh, there's a rather a lot of uncertainty in these, uh, these calculations. And they found 68,000 barrels a day are being, um, were being released into the Gulf, which totals up over 84 days to 4,400,000 barrels of oil, which exceeds the Exxon Valdez in terms of how much oil was spilled. It also exceeds the initial reports that we were given by an order of magnitude. Um, so that's one, that's one paper. Yeah, could, could I comment a little bit about yes. that? Uh, first of <laughs> all, uh, I think we, we need to realize that th th these four papers are, are by four different research groups that got an opportunity to go in and look at what was happening 5,000 feet below the ocean surface, so, so, which is very difficult to even collect samples from that depth. So this was incredibly uh, talented people doing very difficult work. But there were thousands <laughs> of scientists responding to this spill 
with the Coast Guard, with uh, NOAA, with EPA, mm -hmm. uh, the federal agencies, BP brought in their scientists, and the, the, the uh, Gulf states had their scientists. So we owe all of these people a debt of gratitude. There were, there were tens of thousands in HOMA, in New Orleans at the command center, and many of them were scientists looking at various aspects of a spill. Uh, in addition to uh, cr the Crohn's paper, there were a, a panel of government scientists that were convened and looked at four different ways that you could tell how much oil was coming out of that. Clearly, the initial estimates of the amount of oil going in, 1,000 barrels, 5,000 barrels, were way off base, mm -hmm. right? right? And the early stages, remember that oil hadn't started showing, uh, uh, coming ashore, and it was unclear just how much was being released. As people started looking more carefully at the well, they realized that it was way, way more than a thousand barrels. I think the current estimates are somewhere around uh, 58 to 60 thousand barrels a day. There have been a number of ways to look and determine how much oil. Uh, the Crone paper looked at the, they had video pictures of oil flowing into the to the Gulf, and they could tell how fast the oil was rising. They knew the volume of the of the plume, and so they could do some calculations to estimate how much of that oil was getting in the environment. They, they were a great help, but there were a number of scientists that were looking at uh, at this for the uh, the the. Uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and NOAA, the commissioners, uh, Commissioner McNutt and, uh, and uh, uh, Jane Lubajico, uh, convened panels to find out how much oil. And I, I'm feeling pretty comfortable that the, mm -hmm. the estimates that people are coming up with now, that is in the 50 to 60,000 barrel per day, are correct estimates for how much oil. Interesting, the BP scientists are starting to challenge those numbers now. They're saying, well, maybe it wasn't quite that much. So. This will all be played out over the next several uh, several years in the scientific literature. This was the first one of several Absolutely. papers that are going to be coming out, uh, and and some some data supported by BP will undoubtedly be coming out also. So, but science will ultimately understand exactly how much oil was produced. And I think you're bringing up an awful lot of really good points. First of all, it's really kind of cool. Um, to think about the number of scientists who were involved. And yeah. they didn't see their families for weeks and months. Um, Absolutely. And that's cool. Um, and this, the reason that we have selected these papers is because they're the first ones that have made it through that peer review process. Having said that, that doesn't mean this is the final word. <laughs> so, as he says, these papers will be challenged not just by BP, but by other scientists who are making other observations. And so that's an, a really excellent point that you brought up. Um, I, you know, something I'd like to interject yeah, just to sure. sort of give, give the uh, watchers a, a visual. Sure. Uh, I sort of liken it to having uh, several pieces, parts of a puzzle, mm -hmm. and handling, handing them to three different scientists. And the first scientist looks at his and says, well, it looks to me like this is probably a blue crab. Mm -hmm. And the uh, next scientist says, well, I think this might be a brown pelican. And the next one says, I think it's a red fish. And then they mm -hmm. all get together, and time passes, and they get more parts to that puzzle, and they put it together, and somebody says, oh my gosh, it's the Gulf ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, it that's all right. comes together over time as all of these different pieces come together. And that's, that's what we do for a living, day that's by day. absolutely true. And that's a very nice way of putting it. I would have said it's like looking at different parts of an elephant. But <laughs> that is much nicer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Much more appropriate. <laughs> well, exactly. Right. It How works about for us. Parts of a whale? Yeah. <laughs> what do you have another study, David? I do have a couple of other studies. The second one is actually kind of entertaining um, because we've been hearing about plumes. And this paper is, um, none of these papers is by a single author, but the only one I'm going to name is the lead author here. His name is Dr. Camilli. Um, I'm not sure if that's how he pronounces it, but he's at Woods Hole in Massachusetts, at the Oceanographic Institute there. This paper came out in early October, and he um, took part in cruises. He actually organized the cruises in June, and they used autonomous underwater vehicles um, as well as water sampling over the side of a ship to look to see if there was oil in the water. And they found plumes at about 50 to 500 meters, and they found plumes, a very continuous plume, at 1,100 meters of depth. And that plume was 35 kilometers in length, and it persisted for months. Um, the, the shallower one was more diffuse, 
Um, another interesting point about this is that the hydrocarbons varied in composition, which is completely it, along the lines of what you were talking about. Um, the most important thing in this paper, besides um, showing the plume and defining how a plume is defined, is that they were able to show this is not from natural sources. There are many methane seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is not from those natural seeps. But they also did not confirm huge reductions mm -hmm. in oxygen that would be um, occurring if there were um, a lot of microbial activity consuming a lot of the, uh, the oil. So oil being consumed by bacteria uses up oxygen and there has been concern that the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico would be at risk because of this oil spill providing that organic matter source and they did not find that to be a problem. Yeah, virtually all of, of the uh, information that, that, that Camille found was in fairly deep uh, areas and the plumes were fairly dilute. Uh, people hear the word plume and, and they think <laughs> of different things. They think of a plume of smoke or a plume of lava flowing down. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the plume that people really saw down in the deep gulf was more like a plume of smoke, very dilute oil leaving. There was not a black layer of oil in the deep water. Oil is less dense than water, so if it's thick enough to, for you and I to see, it comes up to the surface. It, it floats up just like a cube of ice would pop to the surface. So it has to be dispersed in these tiny, tiny little droplets. And those are the plumes that Camille uh, and, and the other uh, guys talked about. And it's very interesting here today to wrap this up on this third segment, and we right. want to remind everyone that we can also let you know that you can find out more on our companion website at spillscience.com, that you can find in-depth information about topics related to the spill, as well as video discussions from scientists studying the effects of the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. You may also want to join our discussion on our blog section of our site, where you can engage in discussions with scientists studying the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Again, all of this you can find at SpillScience.com. Some great discussion here today on that. And that's all for this edition of the Science of the Spill. Until next time, I'm Aaron Pickens. And I'm Dr. Bob Thomas. This program was made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation, a co-production by Mississippi Public Broadcasting and the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory.